Well, good evening. Welcome to Yada Yah. I can tell you for certain that Israel uh, had better be bracing to be strong. Uh, we had a brief, um, or maybe it was a little longer than a brief review of here are the conditions that are changed in the world uh, to put uh, Israel at a uh, the crossroads for what will be a very uh, difficult situation uh, here in the next either few weeks or a few years. It's hard to tell if it's going to um, occur really very, very rapidly or if it could be uh, several uh, years away. But clearly this is going to happen in, uh, in short order. Um, it, the, uh, I can't say the progress, but the uh, fact is it's just, it is just the, uh, the opposite. Uh, it appears that uh, Saudi Arabia um, – has uh, gone uh, full tilt uh, anti-Israel, uh, and that, that they want to be the uh, the new um, power broker for uh, uh, an all um, Islamic assault against uh, Israel. Uh, and we went through the various things that are happening that are going to be a problem. But here's what's happened just in the last week. Uh, first, Saudi Arabia met with uh, Assad of Syria, which would, of course, be the uh, launching place for a considerable part of an assault against Israel. Uh, and then they met with the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. They had a, a meeting at the uh, with Mikey, uh, as I call him, uh, uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed, um, uh, and I think Riyadh, uh, so high-level meeting, uh, and they finished the meeting with a boss uh, who, you know, is the biggest loser in the world. I mean, is a guy that never won an election, uh, was unwilling to hold any more elections, has managed either to kill or to remove anybody that is a competitor to him. It's, it's a disgusting human being. But nonetheless, they met with him, and... Uh, the conclusion of the meeting is says that they will assure that there is a Palestinian state. Uh, that wasn't enough. They not only met with uh, the Hamas leadership, they pranced around the Kaaba with them. So the Hamas leadership has not only been brought to Saudi Arabia, but got the royal religious treatment there. Um, so when you consider those developments, I, 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 there's really no way to look at it other than Israel is in a serious position. Uh, during Holocaust yeah. uh, Remembrance Day, the Iranians, I listened to the, uh, the speech, the Iranians were parading their weaponry, their drones, their rockets, and the, uh, the like, and saying that uh, they intend to destroy uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa. Uh, they, of course, would love to destroy uh, uh, Jerusalem, too, but, you know, there's some Muslim assets there. Uh, so, wow. hey, boy, you have uh, Iran saying, you know, all of this military hardware, we have an enemy, and the enemy is Israel, uh, and we intend uh, to, uh, to destroy them. And you have Saudi Arabia having just formed uh, a, a diplomatic uh, ties with them. Uh, and have recently exchanged ambassadors and had a number of high-level meetings uh, with Saudi Arabians in uh, Tehran and um, uh, Iranians uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so this is really a bad situation for Israel. Yeah. And so we were talking before the show uh, because uh, Dode, David, the Messiah and King, is calling – Israelites back home to uh, to Israel, uh, and Yahweh is as well, and because they are, we are. And so is it safe to go back to Israel, because there's going to be war? Um, I am virtually certain that the two-state solution will be imposed on Israel, uh, and retranslating uh, Daniel, which I'm now in the midst of of doing, uh, I guess, is my ninth uh, rewrite of the Yada Yawa series, and that's a lot now, because there's 30 books in it. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But I've, I've got to eliminate uh, all references to Yosha and present Dode uh, correctly. Uh, and that's a lot because mm -hmm. I think Yosha was uh, mentioned some 2,400 times. Uh, and uh, Dode is is mentioned even more, probably 5,000 times uh, over uh, maybe even more than that. And, of course, you've got to have his comprehensive uh, resume as opposed to just part of it. Um, but the question is, is it safe for, uh, for Jews to go back to Israel? And clearly, if you're covenant, God's going to protect you, and an early exit is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, Right. Uh, so going back as covenant is uh, is low risk. Going back as non-covenant, deadly. Well, yeah, that's big risk. Um, but look what uh, is happening uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, I was reading an article this afternoon on on uh, Sweden, and uh, Sweden by uh, saying that they were going to open their doors doors to uh, Muslims. Um, Following the uh, United States debacle in, in uh, uh, Syria and, uh, and uh, Iraq, where we essentially uh, destroyed the life there in that part of the uh, the world, uh, refugees fled out of Libya, which we broke, um, Syria, which we broke, Afghanistan, which we broke, and and uh, Iraq. Um, and there are places now in Sweden where. They are the majority, uh, Muslims, uh, and they want to speak Arabic, and they want to go attack Jews, and they want to burn s synagogues. Uh, so uh, even in the most liberal of European countries, it's tough to be a Jew. Um, yeah. Neo-Nazism is on the rise. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. So it's going to be difficult to be a Jew. There's many places in France, for example, you can't go wearing a kippah, uh, identifying yourself as Jewish, uh, uh, becoming that way in places in New York. Um, and the resentment is going to become much greater in the United States when our economy collapses as a result of, uh, of all of the stupidity that we're involved in between the sanctions uh, against Russia. Oh, the news on uh, most recent news is now there's absolute proof that we have American troops fighting in the Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. We've sent, we've sent uh, yeah. special forces in, which was pretty much uh, uh, a fait accompli when you start sending Patriot missile batteries in and you're sending in uh, 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 squadrons of, uh, of advanced jets and, and our top uh, end tanks and uh, that sort of thing. You have to have Americans uh, that have been trained to run them. So we are now directly fighting it in the, uh, the Ukraine. Uh, but when our economy collapses, the, uh, the favorite of, of uh, the disenfranchised is to uh, scream, blame the Jews. Mm -hmm. And there is an undercurrent right now in America. Um, my wife and Dee were talking about it uh, earlier today, uh, where um, blacks, particularly in public service jobs, are uh, um, are uh, staging personal protests of stand your ground, this is my space. And so if a Caucasian comes up to them, say at the supermarket or at uh, a uh, post office, uh, they will either refuse service or be so rude that there is no service. And they're belligerent about it. Their idea is this is quiet reparations. I'm gonna stand my ground, this is my space. You can't have it. And so it is a social movement of uh, making the Caucasian pay for uh, the uh, abuses that have been um, perceived because uh, black lives are so uh, obviously unhappy and unfulfilling, they find a need to blame someone. And, and my issue here is, is exceedingly straightforward and simple. Uh, which is that, well, I personally am colorblind. I, I have, uh, you know, I've adopted three young men on this island, and, and all three are black. And I spend a great deal of my time and money mentoring and, uh, and helping them. Uh, and uh, I'm still 
disappointed in the attitude uh, and even in the culture of, uh, of black America. We're, we, we have a problem of violence in the home, of fathers not staying around to honor that role in that community, and of mothers being abusive to their children. Uh, and we're creating a generation after generation of young men that, and young men, women that don't want to work, that don't know how to work, and that are overly aggressive and unable to use words when engaging uh, and becoming belligerent and hostile. Uh, it's part of the reason that if a black person is killed, 90% uh, of the time it's at the hand of another black person. Like all the most recent police brutality is five or six black officers against a, a black victim. Uh, but the reality is this, and it is exceedingly simple. Um, well, there was indeed slavery here in the United States. There was slavery throughout the world. Uh, slavery has been part of the civilized world since uh, recorded time. We can go back 6,000 years, and for 6,000 years, slavery was the mainstay of most economies. I hate slavery. I wouldn't have a slave uh, under you. any circumstances, wouldn't want to be a slave, and <laughs> wouldn't want a slave. Yeah. Uh, and slaves have been of every ethnicity. But in true. Uh, places like Pompeii, uh, you know, a city where we now have enormous amounts of evidence of what took place there, 90% uh, of, the, of the people in Pompeii were slaves. Uh, in Athens, which, you know, we think was so enlightened, 80% uh, of, of the people who lived in Athens were slaves. The average life expectancy of a slave was 17 years in Greece and in Rome. Hmm. I mean, this was the world. And there isn't a, a major civilization that didn't have a caste system and didn't have slaves at the bottom of that caste system. It was the way the world worked. And it is also true that uh, in terms of, of slaves in America, which I, I wish it hadn't happened, but it uh, it did just as it's right. happened every place in the world, um, 100% of the slaves were captured by other black Africans, 100% of them. And they were sold to Muslims who then sold them to uh, companies like the, uh, uh, the uh, Dutch and, and others. Please. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is what uh, this is what transpired, and it was no different in Africa. In fact, there are there's more of a slave culture now in Africa than probably any place in the world. And the quality of life in Africa for a blacks and an all black community is not good. Uh, America, over the last 40 years, 50 years, mm -hmm. has been the least racist, most upwardly mobile country in the history of the world, ever. There has been no country that has given more opportunity to a wider spectrum of people than the United States. I'm not a patriot. I uh, can th tell you a thousand things that are wrong with America. But if your <laughs> gripe is that you are black and therefore you think that you have been cheated against in America, the opposite is true. There is no country in the world where you have more opportunity and upward mobility than you do in America, and that includes every black country where blacks are the majority of the population. These are, that's just the truth. And if you can't make it here, it isn't because of your skin color. It's because of your character. That's the truth. Whether or not you want to live with it, disagree with it, your prerogative. But you can't argue against right. that with evidence and reason. But unfortunately, in a progressive world, truth doesn't matter. 
Evidence doesn't matter. Reason doesn't matter. And so with the kind of poison that's being promoted, uh, that's going to create horrible pushback with, uh, with racism of, uh, of blacks towards Caucasians. Um, we're going to find ourselves in a position like Israel is right now. Not Israel, the divide is between progressives and the, uh, uh, and the religious. Um, but here it's going to be uh, likely along um, racial lines. And I'm here to tell you that there's a much, much higher percentage of blacks that have animosity towards whites than there are whites that have animosity towards blacks. All forms of racism are bad. Yeah. But reverse racism is no better than the other kind, and now per capita it is more prevalent. Uh, so we need to speak uh, against it, um, uh, including racism towards uh, towards Jews. This is a all of it is a horrible idea. I have no issue. God has no issue. If you want to be anti-religion, by all means, anti-Judaism, anti-Christianity, anti. Islam, anti-Hinduism, anti-communism, uh, socialist, secular, humanism. Uh, you want to judge these systems, that's a reasonable and appropriate thing to do. It is never an appropriate thing to judge people based upon their skin color. And unfortunately, we have migrated from having um, a problem of Caucasians being racist against blacks to the other way around, where most Caucasians are not racist and most blacks are. It's that pendulum swing. Yeah, it is a, but this is a, this is a devastating one that's going to cause serious problems. All right. Especially for so with Jews. that review of the, uh, the world that is crumbling before our eyes, I want to read again, um, Mismore 226, because uh, we were about to speak of how this was um, later explained in Yashaya uh, 41. And uh, there is this synergism that exists between Dode's Mismore and Yashaya's prophecies. They are hand in glove. You want to understand the Mismore? Read. Uh, uh, Isaiah. You want to understand uh, the prophecies that Yashaya uh, puts forth? Read Dodes Mizmor. They uh, they literally are hand in glove, and this is going to be one uh, example of that. So Mizmor twenty two six, speaking of Dode as the Passover lamb uh, being beaten by the Romans to the point that he was being filleted uh, alive, uh, this, the soft tissues uh, and tendons literally being ripped off of his upper body and, uh, and legs. Uh, he wrote a thousand years before it occurred, I am but a crimson grub, a toala, a bloodied worm and scarlet pulp, no longer extant or present as a person, rebuked and taunted and insulted and dishonored by humankind and disrespected and demeaned by the family. He obviously knew what was going to happen to him, and yet he volunteered for this mission. Now, this is a person that Dode has said, he's my firstborn, he's my chosen one. I've anointed him the Messiah. He is um, certainly in the top three prophets of all time. Uh, but he's God's favorite person, and God had already promised that he was going to return uh, and be king of kings. Uh, let's have uh, the firstborn's inheritance. And yet he volunteered to be disrespected by his people 
and humankind at large while being tortured by the most evil empire in the history of the world. And you might say, well, why would a guy that's got it all subject himself to that? And when you know the answer to that question, then everything begins to make sense. You can understand that there aren't two advents of Dode David, but three. And the Dode David is the leading um, uh, character in all seven Moed Mikre. They right. revolve around him. Uh, yeah. And that uh, he is the one, according to the Mizmor that we read um, several weeks ago, that came to the conclusion that he needed to do this. He didn't just want to uh, fulfill the most heroic deed in human history, the most benevolent. He needed to do it. And you might say, why would a guy who God himself has said, I'm going to make him king of the world for all eternity. Why would he feel the need to do this? This is a guy that God said, he's not only my son and I'm his father, but he's right. I love him. Why would he do this? Uh, the reason is really pretty straightforward, and and it's uh, gut wrenching, and it has nothing to do with humankind dishonoring, taunting, and insulting him. There are not going to be a, very many goy in eternity. It's certainly per capita. It's his family. They're the ones that disrespected and demeaned him. And it's inexcusable that they would do so. <clears throat> Ms. Moore 22 is exceedingly clear. First person, written by Dode, him suffering is the Passover lamb. Psalm 88, same thing. Yeshua 53, same thing. When you get to Daniel 9, which is the only prophecy that speaks of someone as a masiach committing a, an act of benevolence where they're cut down and separated but not for themselves. It is the only one that Christianity can hang its hat on and say, well, that must be our guy. But it's spoken by Dode. And the reason it mentions masiach twice is because He's the Masiach. He's the one fulfilling it, and it's obvious. <clears throat> Jews can read Hebrew, and yet they missed it. They're looking for their Messiah. They don't know that it's Dode. They haven't a clue that he fulfilled Pesach as the Passover lamb, or Matzah, and took guilt of Israel and the covenant members with him in the shield, deposited there. They don't know it. Right. And not only don't they know it, they disrespected him. Imagine you volunteer for the single most heroic and compassionate act in all of human history. That you're going to serve as the Passover lamb to give your people new life, you're going to take all of their guilt with you into Sheol and deposit it there so they can be perfected. And then you're going to demonstrate the result, which is Bukudim being born spiritually into Yahweh's family. You're going to do this. And then you're going to come back and anoint the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to fulfill the Day of Reconciliation, Yom Kippurim. And yet your own people are denying that you've done this. When 
there must be a hundred prophecies that say explicitly that Toad's doing all of it. And, you know, at one point it gets exacerbated, 89th Mizmore, and said, you know, I've made all of these promises to my son, to Toad. If not to him, I'm a liar. And you don't get it. So it tells us an enormous amount about him. He's heroic. He's compassionate. He cares enough of his people, for his people, to be the one guy that's willing to man up and say, I'll pay the price to redeem them. Why still would he do it? Other than it's the right thing to do. Well, because he looked at Moshe's experience, and Moshe was as stout an individual as there ever was. I, I don't think in all of human history you'd find a better man of character, of passion for God, of uh, zealousness for the truth and for uh, the freedom of his people. I don't think there's a better man in human history. And I agree. <laughs> Jews turned mm-hmm. on him. Yep. You can't. Here's a guy that tried to save them when, when he was in the lap of luxury in Egypt, and he tried to save them, and they turned on him. And he left to go to uh, Arabia to tend sheep. And God says, I want you to go back there with me and free the people. I said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, I love that place. I want nothing to do with that place. I said, no, no, I really need you. I want you to go back with me to do this. And he does it. And he, he spends 40 years leading them out. And what do they do? Bellyache and grumble, and at one point they threaten to kill him. They blame everything on him. Jews are really tough. They devour their own. Toad wrote the most comprehensive essay ever on the Torah, the 119th Mismore. He tells you exactly how to observe it. So I can assure you he knows who Moses was and what happened to him and how the people turned on him. He knows his people. Well, look at his own son. His own son turned on him. Mm-hmm. Is uh, is the people's choice of king turned on him? So he knows his people, and he knows that if there isn't something really extraordinary and enduring, that it's impossible to be their king. Impossible even if you're dealing with the best of them. Look, he went and killed Goliath. And I don't think people have an understanding of what was at stake. There were, there were two basic ways that nations fought. And the outcome was, if you lost, a significant amount of your people would be killed. Uh, the ones who were not killed would become slaves of the other nation forever, and the women would be raped. That was the consequence. If you lost, you're a slave or dead or raped. And the two ways they fought is they, you know, big armies, you go out in an open field and you... Yeah, you keep on hacking until uh, one side has hacked more people to death than the other. Gory and disgusting. Or you had a, uh, uh, like the uh, Trojan War, where you have one person says, okay, we'll go out in combat, and one-on-one, whoever wins that one battle of the other nation uh, gets to subjugate uh, the, the loser. Goliath was the biggest, toughest, bravest strongest, most capable soldier among the, uh, the Philistines and, uh, and maybe in the world at that time. And Dode 
Uh, you know, I like to think he was eight years old because Yahweh yeah, anoints him uh, and calls him Hamasiach and uh, imbues him with his spirit at uh, eight years old. And it is the next story. Right after that, it's the next story. That doesn't mean that it happened the same year. It could have happened uh, four years later or five years later. But it is the next story. And so he is a... Uh, Likely not even a teenager yet. Could be as young as 8, 10, 12 years old. And no one among the Israelites wants to go against him. They don't think they, you know, with the sword they have a chance. He's going to kill them. And then all the people are enslaved. Dodd uh, says, I'll do it. No problem. Well, did he pick up uh, five stones and put one in the sling? And and that was it. And so he, for for a matter of, uh, of a few years, was thought of uh, as heroic. But Shaul turned against him almost immediately and pursued him, tried to kill him. Oh. Dode's fully aware of, of the of the attitude of his people and it isn't good. Here, Yahweh just happens to be God. He's offering us the deal of the universe. I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to perfect you. I'm going to adopt you like you're my kid. I'm going to enrich you. I'm going to power you. I'm going to liberate you. And I don't want anything other than some respect and uh, you not bring your trash into my home. And yet, as magnanimous as he is, as brilliant as he is, as generous as he is, there hasn't been a Jew that's been thankful to Yahweh in 3,000 years. And they couldn't even get out of Egypt without besmirching him. And so if God can't please them, how in the world is Dode going to be able to leave them, uh, leave them for eternity? Dode knew that's what I'm up against. So he went to Yon and says, there, there's a solution here. And uh, there's, there's something a whole lot bigger and longer lasting than knocking off uh, Goliath. Something a lot bigger than than uh, unifying Israel, defending uh, Israel against every enemy, winning uh, 66 consecutive battles, uh, and uh, uh, building the uh, the city of Jerusalem. Something much bigger than that. And the answer was that if he agrees to serve as the Pesach Eo, the Passover lamb. And he's the reason that we have renewed life through the covenant. And then he's the one that takes our guilt with his soul, his nephesh, in the shield, and deposits it there so that we look perfect in God's eyes, and therefore we can enter heaven and live as part of the God's covenant family and receive the same benefits that Dode's going to receive, for all time, because of what he did, well, we will be eternally grateful. He will have earned our respect. And not for a few minutes and not for a few years, but for forever. Because we're only there because of what he did. And so he's looking at Yahweh and said, this is the answer. And it's perfect because... The whole idea of Chagmasa is to, the result of it is Bukurim, firstborn children. I'm your firstborn. I'm your son. It's perfect. And then I can be the living embodiment and the example of Shabua, to be enriched, to be enlightened, to be liberated, empowered. So, God recognized, you're right, the perfect answer. I will not deny you 
of this because it's two days for all eternity. And you are the perfect choice. You've made the right call. That's why he was called Sadak Wright. So when you read that all humankind had um, rebuked him, taunted him, insulted him, ripped the flesh off of him, this is Rome doing this to him, and that he was there voluntarily, and that his own people disrespected him, demeaned him, dismissed him. Left him, yeah. Just think, just think of the responsibility that we bear for that. The frustration of the father. Yeah. So, that's what's being said. Uh, I've uh, overemphasized probably this whole thing because uh, I was supposed to just pick up on Toaba and uh, and move on. But uh, here's the here's the reference no, 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 to, uh, to Toaba. I mean, this thing is. Uh, is vitally important. It's so vitally important. Understanding Dode's motivation. Why? You know, we all know and we have known for 20 years that the person coming back is Dode. Yeah, I was said it as bluntly and as blatantly and as often as he could possibly say it. The kingdom is Dode's. He's going to reign. Uh, forevermore. So we know there's a second coming of Dode. So why are we so surprised that, they, that there's a third? And we know there's a second coming of uh, Elia. So God is fully capable of, uh, of bringing back someone. He's bringing back Elia. Uh, He's bringing the us other back wit- too. Yeah, the <laughs> other witness is going to be you know, harvested Very during good. Teruah is going to come back too. God's capable of doing that. And he's clearly capable of doing it to bring Dode back for all eternity. So why was it so difficult for someone to accept three times with Dode as opposed to twice? And how many times was Dode anointed? Three times. That's, yep. that's it. And the three appearances yeah, so, a year, you know, I think... Are tied to the three appearances of Dode. That's it's all there. The symmetry. Yes. The, the, in mm-hmm. fact, the history of humankind from the garden back to the garden. That's six thousand years is divided into three forty-year yeah. bell periods. <laughs> yeah. He's the and Dode lived in the very heart of it, in the center of that time. Right. So. He was kind of it the is. beginning and end of that thousand years in the middle, actually. It's kind of funny. Yes. The thing that is so important for us is to appreciate how the covenant is the centerpiece of the Torah. And the cornerstone of the covenant, well, that is uh, is Abraham in terms of the, the person it was founded with and, and through him. To, uh, to Jacob, who becomes Yisrael, but the living embodiment of it is Dode. Yep. And he's the one that Yahweh says, he's my son. He's my firstborn. He's the living embodiment of this covenant, and he is the means to it. There is no access to the covenant without the seven Moed Mikre. And he is the one that made each of those possible working with Yahweh. Every step of the way was father and son. And coming to understand how father and son work together to bring us all collectively into the covenant family. Uh, along this path of the Moed Mekre, over this long period of time that it has been foretold and and foreshadowed and then fulfilled, all of that time it has been a father and son, um, filled by father and son, described as father and son. You have an understanding of what Yahweh was trying to achieve, and you get a, a clear picture 
of what God values most in us. And then you, if you form a picture of what really matters and who you're going to be spending eternity with. And then an appreciation of, of the motivation and the mindset and the character and the brilliance of someone uh, like Dode. So it is, it's a very big deal to understand this. This is, this is not one of those uh, things that you say, okay, well, we, uh, we, we get it. Let's move on to the next. Um, and I'm going to be spending with our um, edit team and fact check team and publishing team, we're going to be spending the next probably six months oh, going back through every volume to uh, to make certain that this is correctly stated. Anyway, this is, uh, um, um, I have a, I, I guess I have a crush on a prophet. There's there's one prophet that I consider, uh, and, and shoot me if you think I'm wrong. I did, good luck with that. Uh, yeah. I really, I really like Yasha I, I And yeah. it's apparent that, that it's a mutual kind of thing. We have a, we have a thing for each other. And Yashiya is the one that uh, picked up on this. He would have picked up on it, you know, probably 250 years after uh, uh, Dode's uh, first of three uh, lives. And this is what he wrote. And one day we will go into the 41st uh, uh, chapter of Yashiya and cover the whole thing from beginning to end because it's all about Dode. And it says, you should never be afraid. You should never be anxious, O Tola'a, O worm of Jacob. People of Yisrael, I myself am here to help and support you, prophetically announces Yahweh. Wow. Your kinsman redeemer is the set-apart one of Yisrael. Think about that. This is Yashaya telling us that worm is Zod. Zod is the one person that Yahweh says, he is my Kodesh. He is the set-apart one. He is the kinsman redeemer, the Ga'al. And so here he is 250 years earlier, described himself as looking like a, a, a tola'a, which is really prophetic in the sense that the Romans used that to die to die all of their military and uh, political uh, outfits, togas, so that they would look uh, fearsome because uh, it's this blood red dye, and they're the ones tearing him apart and making him look like a bloodied worm. Uh, and here it yeah. said, don't be afraid, O oh, worm of Jacob. Who's the worm of Jacob? Dode. He just mm-hmm. told you that in the 22nd Mismore. I myself am here to help. And this is the beauty of, of everything we witness with Dode. You can personalize it. You can make it apply to you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. To Dee, to Kirk, to everyone yep. who is part of the covenant family. You have nothing to fear because I am with you. Prophetically announces Yahweh. Your kinsman redeemer is the set apart one. Your kinsman redeemer. Kins of who? Just said it. Jacob. Israel. He's the set-apart one of Israel, and he is your redeemer. Yahweh didn't say, I am your redeemer. Yahweh's not kin to Israel. He wants to be their father, and that one day will happen. But Dode is the kinsman redeemer of Israel. So Dode's Mismore and uh, Yashaya's prophetic portrayals of our salvation are 
literally inseparable concepts, as I shared earlier. They're hand and glove, especially when mm-hmm. identifying Dode as the sacrificial lamb and when presenting the set-apart one of Yisrael as the kinsman redeemer of his people. Uh, I had the opportunity, and I think you probably uh, read it uh, uh, recently. Both of you probably have read it recently, Kirk and Dave. Yeah. And yes. uh, I had the opportunity to go back and represent both Daniel 9, based upon what we know, and Yeshaya 9. And they are so poignant and so obviously speaking of Dota's the Gabor Dode as the Messiah, uh, being the one who was doing the fulfilling. I mean, Dode is the one person that Yahweh says, he is my son. A child is born, a son is given. Well, there's only one son that can be given. Mm -hmm. There's only one who had the government on his shoulders. There's only one person that Yahweh says, he is a Gabor, courageous, confident, capable, combative. Um, it's obvious. And how his people missed it. And how can you read Yeshua 41 here and Mizmore 22 and not understand that Dode is your kinsman redeemer? That's what the words say. Religion did its job well. <laughs> Pardon? Well, you know, right. Go ahead, Kirk. Uh, no, I was going to say, I keep thinking about Yashi Yash scrolls from the Dead Sea Scrolls are sitting there in the rotunda right there in Jerusalem. All you got to do is go over and read the thing if you read Hebrew. Yes. Yeah. I was and, saying religion. Nobody, did it nobody in town can read it? Yeah. I mean, I'm almost in tears reading this stuff. I mean, what's wrong? It is. It it is. Yeah. uh, It is uh, the the first moment that you you realize Dode's motivation and his argument with Yahweh. Argument's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Uh, Yeah, it's a debate. You you get goosebumps, and then you break down in tears. I had tears rolling down my cheeks for hours. Because it's one thing. We... So many of us talked about it. I wrote it uh, down in, in, in chapters of, of books that were published three, four, five years ago. Uh, we all recognize that that the words themselves all paint Dode as the person who is enduring all of this for us. Mm-hmm. But yet you couldn't come out and say it was his soul because we didn't understand why he would want to do it. God clearly is not going well, to let him. do it. So yeah. why did he want to do it, and why did Yahweh agree? Yeah. And I exactly. think that is the most profound awakening you can have along the way. It's the thing that has God so frustrated. You know, it's one thing to have demeaned his name and and uh, completely removed it from the people's vocabulary. But to demean one's son when he did this for you, this is the pivot upon which all things move one way or the other. Uh, Deed, uh, last week we, uh, I think you talked about all the history of uh, the uh, Tola, uh, I don't think we need to go back into it again, but it is a, it is a perfect metaphor for the Pesach Gael because of the the nature of this worm and and how it sacrifices its life for uh, its children and future generations. Yes. In uh, due time, we will, as I promised, we're going to remove, return to the prophecies found in Yeshayah 41. Uh, and, you know, it was an interesting uh, uh, experience. I, um, I devoted uh, three years to rewriting every book in the Yada Yah series. And then we finally moved into new territory with uh, the Babel series, uh, one book 
being rewritten, the first one, and then two new additions to the Babel series. And along the way, we took Introduction to God and went to, from one volume to three volumes and, and Questioning Paul from uh, one volume to four volumes. And uh, the uh, presentation of the Moed Mikre went from one volume to three volumes. Uh, we added a lot along the way. Uh, but I... Uh, I was really thrilled with finally getting out of Ezekiel. and, and uh, We moved back into coming home, and, and we were progressing through the Psalms. And <laughs> uh, I got six, cha- six chapters into it. I don't need to go back and <laughs> do another rewrite. But uh, that is the difference between being a prophet and being a witness. A the prophet gets everything right because God has inspired them to say, giving them fresh revelation, you communicate this, this is from me, and so everything you say, because I'm inspiring this, uh, is word for word correct uh, about everything that's in the past, everything in the future, everything in the present, and consistent with the household story. As a witness, your job is to study those prophets, to go back as far as you can to the oldest texts, Read them as they were written in the oldest form of the uh, of the alphabet and the language, and then mm-hmm. to translate it so that it is available not only to yourself to think about, but for uh, the generation of people alive today, and then to make it pertinent to them. That's what Moshe did in Debarim. Uh Make it pertinent to them. That's what Dode did with the 109th Mizmor. You're talking to your people and saying, this is what God said at that time. This is what it means to you. Uh, that's the, the role of a witness. And uh, so it is part of the course to know that you are going to learn and share Learn some more and refine what you know and and uh, share a more complete uh, picture as you continue to uh, be taught, listen, and learn. And so when uh, we come to understand the motivation for Dode serving to fulfill not just Pesach Matzah B'Kodem, and he's the exemplar for Shabuah, we're talking about him through Teruah. He is the one coming back to fulfill uh, Yom Kippurim, to anoint the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, and he is king of Sukkah. When you learn this, then you update what you have written to make it as accurate as possible. So it is part of the job to know that you're going to continue to learn, and as you learn, it's important that you keep the uh, the record straight and so it's uh this is what we do uh and it is uh, it is a much better position to be in uh, you might say okay well if uh, if a witness is going to uh, learn on the job and refine the message as uh, as we go along then why didn't God just say I'm going to have a prophet Well, a lot of reasons for that. Uh, One is that God told us everything we need to know through the prophets. He even had to tell Daniel, who was, by the way, Daniel was not a prophet. He was also a witness. Uh, And he told him that, uh, Dode said, what I'm going to do is going to bring an end to the prophets. There aren't going to be any more of them. Going to wrap up prophecy. <laughs> so God's already on record really? saying there's not going to be any more of it. God no, it's just complete. And there wasn't a single Yahud that was willing to listen to him. Prophets have all been Israelites. There wasn't a single one willing to listen. And the message that God wanted to deliver by having a witness, not a prophet was that I've already given you everything you needed to know. Why don't you just do what we're doing yeah. here? Yeah. Read it. 
with an open mind, go where the words lead. And a witness can do that. And the other advantage is if you're claiming to be a prophet, which I'm not, then you're claiming that you've got your own little private revelation and that you ought to trust me on my little private revelation because that's what I, you know, I receive personally. Think how different that is than being a witness who says, I am translating and commenting on what has been widely available, which you can fact check for yourself for better part of 3,000 years. And instant credibility, if the translations are correct, and the reason, the logic, can be followed, and it's consistent, then you have all the proof you need. Where the only way as a prophet to provide proof would be to have enough time for whatever God reveals to be meaningful enough to the lives of Israel to happen within a short period of time, because we don't have a lot of time left, after the revelation. No. And so there isn't enough time left to validate a prophet. There are no Jews willing to serve as a prophet. And it's far more credible if you're a witness and you're translating and commenting on the prophets who have already written this revelation for us because now everybody can go back and check and say, Yep, that's what it says, and that person validated their credential, their uh, prophetic credentials by getting every one of their prophecies right. So you have instant proof, total credibility. Uh, but that's not the end of it. It's designed to be embarrassing. Just as Jews should be embarrassed that they have not recognized that their Messiah, their king, served as the Passover lamb, took their guilt with him into Sheol, and is returning to fulfill Yom Kippur, and you should be embarrassed. That's why when Yahweh says in Zechariah, they will look upon me, and then they will weep for him that they have pierced, as one would weep for an only child, because it's gut-wrenching what you've done. And you should be embarrassed. So what better way for Yahweh to get his people's attention and said, shame on you. I laid it all out for you and you spit in my face. So what did I do? I went to a goy. And without any private revelation, he figured it out. And he's the one calling you home. He's the one telling you about Dode and what he represents. You ought to be embarrassed yep. that it was there the whole time, and you missed it. It is embarrassing. If you're one of those Jews that said, I'm not listening to a goy, well, then you're in real trouble, because you're damn sure not listening to God. Shame on you. A lot of reasons that Yah chose it to be this way. Even today, the vast preponderance of people show no regard for Dode's compassion or heroics. Not one person in a million acknowledges the association between the king and the fulfillment of Chagmatsa. And that's inexcusable. Because it was the single most important act in human history and there is no act that was more abundantly detailed huh, in excruciating detail a thousand years before it happened. But Joe telling us this was going to occur. You know, in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, book do you think they're the most of in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Pardon? What do you think? Yes, Isaiah. Yeah. The Mismore. Oh, oh. those Mismore. Okay. Well, there are oh, more yeah, copies yeah, yeah. of those sure. Mismore than anything else. <laughs> I think uh, I think Yashia is Duh. the third. It's number yeah, one uh, is uh, is the Torah. There are more copies mm-hmm. of the Torah than anything else in the Dead Sea Scrolls collection. So, uh, so excuse me. There are more copies of the Mizmor. Second to the Mizmor is the Torah, and third is Yashia. Those three are the dominant three. And so, I was thinking of complete works. Uh, I got you. Yes. Yeah. No. It's, but but the that's the thing about the Mizmor. You know, think of the Mizmor as uh, as chapters. Yeah. You know, if it, it, it's it's the book of the Mizmor, rather than look at it as a hundred uh, independent psalms, it's the same as. Uh, as if Yashaya had a hundred chapters. Okay. And so there are more more scrolls devoted to the Psalms, the Mizmor, uh, than to the Torah, and more Torah than Yashaya, and it goes uh, falls off precipitously from uh, from that point. So we have plenty of copies. We we know that Dode wrote an excruciatingly detailed presentation of how crucifixion kills that was written in first person about what he himself would endure a thousand years before he endured it and 800 years before Roman crucifixion was invented. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Think about how amazing that is. That's the beauty of doing what we're doing now, is that Dode has proven his credentials as not only the most heroic and compassionate man who ever lived, uh, and the most brilliant, but as a prophet. So we're not asking you to trust us, but you sure ought to trust him. And we're not giving you a translation with no basis, we're providing you with every word. I mean, this situation that we find ourselves in is, is inexcusable since there are so many exacting prophecies that uh, have been fulfilled and that most of these were made many, many, many centuries before Rome even existed much less crucifixion with nails existed. Romans executed those they despised along popular roadways, usually naked because it was more humiliating. And like all despicable totalitarian regimes, the torment was designed to have a deterrent effect, evoking fear among eyewitnesses. More than this, civilizations like Rome serve as grotesque projections of gang mentality because the larger the empire and the more powerful the nation the worse they behave boy isn't this ever true with what america became Mm -hmm. yes indeed this uh, insight explains why dode revealed that people were gawking at him shaking their heads and saying senseless things, mouths running faster than their brains. This is now Mismore Song 22-7. All of those who see me, they deride and mock me, speaking unintelligently about me, disparaging me. They shoot off their mouths while they shake their heads. Now, imagine, you're the king of the universe. I mean, who would have thought the universe has a king, but you're king of the universe. The God who created it appointed you king of the universe, and you're allowing these people to mock you, and they're the very people you're trying to save. There is zero chance of a person surviving this life and going to heaven without 
Pesach and Matzah being fulfilled, and he's the one that's doing it, and he's the king of the universe. And rather than appreciating it, we're shooting off our mouths and mocking him, disparaging him. And he knew it was going to occur a thousand years before it did. He wrote it down a thousand years before it happened, and we still did it doesn't speak very highly of God's people. It has been this way from the beginning. Nothing has changed. The world over, everyone speaks unintelligently about Dodd. In fact, apart from those listening to this program and reading these books, I don't even think anybody else knows that his name is Dodd, that it means beloved, <laughs> that it's not David. No. People are always stunned when you say it. And I think if you were to ask a thousand people who's the Son of God, there isn't one in a hundred thousand, maybe not even one in a million that would say Dode. Yes. Oh, yeah. If you ask him who's the Messiah, uh, maybe one in a million might say David. It's one thing for the Romans to mock him. Yeah. They and their church that uh, they inspired never knew any better. Stupid is as stupid does. They were and remain ignorant of Yahweh, his Torah, Bereth, Mikre. They continue to be belligerent towards God, unintelligently stammering while slandering and deriding him. To make matters worse, the Roman Catholic Church deliberately negated those sacrifice, deliberately, by misattributing his title such that he would not be credited for having provided the greatest gift ever offered. It's one thing to have made the sacrifice, but to have the world's most popular religion predicated on attributing it to a misnomer, it's egregious. Hmm. Now, now that we're acknowledging that these psalms were written in first person because Dode lived through them, I'm convinced that this next pronouncement happened exactly as it is written. Dode was immensely proud of his father's name, so much so that it is apparent that he used the pseudonym Yosha to depict what he and Yahweh would accomplish together. He was so courageous and bold there is no doubt that he would have told all who would have listened that he was exactly what was going to transpire, why it would occur, and who was going to make it happen. Yahweh. Yahweh would save him and save us through him. But his audience, like praying zombies, banging their heads against the western wall, was too busy being religious to listen. These are quotes from those mocking and demeaning the Passover lamb as he was fulfilling Pesach to open the doorway to life everlasting. It says, you have chosen to be rolled away, to be removed and sent away to Yahweh. So let's see if he wants to rescue him. Let him choose to deliver and save him. Surely. He desires to be with him. Mizmor Psalm 22a. The implication are earth-shattering. It is it is yet another nail in the coffin of Christianity and Judaism. The lone eyewitness account, the single credible presentation, the only inspired testimonial of the fulfillment of Pesach Passover reveals that those who were there had heard the Messiah tell them that he trusted and relied upon Yahweh. He knew that his soul would survive and be delivered from this ordeal, which is why he volunteered to do it. He realized that the purpose of Passover was to tangibly demonstrate Yahweh's desire to rescue and save his covenant family, and that God wanted us to become immortal because he wanted 
to be with his children, now and forevermore. Dode was simply the foremost among us. So to have this gaggle of goons recorded saying these things mean that Dode spoke about his relationship with Yahweh. It reveals that he had made these declarations publicly, at least to the extent that those passing by knew what he had said. And yet, there isn't even the slightest hint of Yahweh's name or how Yahweh intended to deliver the soul of the Pesach Gael in anything Christians or rabbis call scripture. That's a bitter pill. Boy, I guess. Other than what is recorded in Mizmor Psalm 22 and 88 and Yashaya 41 and 53, there is no other inspired, credible, eyewitness account of Yahweh's father and sons, actually, fulfillment of Yahweh's purpose. Nothing. And Yahweh's purpose with the Dode, father and son, was to provide the Passover lamb and then endure matzah to unleaven our souls, uh, celebrating Bukhuram as a result. Therefore, since this accounting reveals that the onlookers that day in Jerusalem said these things, using these words, they did. And there is no possibility whatsoever they would have said any of this had they not heard the Dode expressing it. So this realization changes the entire narrative of what is claimed by the Christian New Testament and also by the Talmud Yerushalami. For sure. So you, you can either trust mm-hmm. them or you can trust Dode. Believing the inspiration of man are relying upon the man inspired by God. Dode predicted crucifixion, and his role in Roman crucifixion a thousand years before it happened. And we have copies of the 22nd Mismore that precede his fulfillment by 200 years. Pretty hard to um, to speak against that level of credibility. Mm-hmm. Should there be some confusion on this matter, the Talmud, both Jerusalem and Babylonian editions, are strictly rabbinical affairs. They record rabbis debating what they want Jews to believe the Torah means, as if they were better commentators than God. And in this regard, they are completely clueless. Given all they had to work with to discern the truth, to call these men sages is to, well, elevate dumb and dumber to Mensa status. <laughs> That's not to suggest that, uh, what do you think about um, Judaism? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the father of uh, rabbinic Judaism was Rabbi Akiva. And because Rabbi Akiba had this problem with the, the growth and the popularity of Christianity, particularly in and among Jews, he came up with a false messiah, Bar Kokhba, son of a star, uh, in the Yobo year of 133 to combat the growing popularity of uh, uh, this myth. And rather than just say it's a lie and that the truth is that Dode was the Passover lamb, Passover has been fulfilled, no, he came up with a false messiah. Didn't recognize Dode's role. He came up with a false messiah. And that false messiah caused the Romans to come in and destroy Yehuda, Judah. Caused hundreds of thousands of Jews to be crucified. 
caused the diaspora, which led directly to the Holocaust. All as a direct result of the stupidity of Akiba. And you make that idiot the father of your religion? Are you crazy? Elevate dumb and dumber to men's status indeed. Even when it is obvious, it is effortless, or I uh, shouldn't say I should say that this isn't all that easy. It, 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 it takes work. As I've admitted, while I had privately discussed the possibility that Dodd may have served as uh, to fulfill Chagmasa, to be the Passover lamb, it wasn't until I understood his motivations that I was able to appreciate why Yahweh allowed him to serve in this heroic and compassionate fashion. And even then, before publicly acknowledging it, I had to test the validity of the conclusion against each of the prophecies pertaining to the fulfillment of these events to verify that they were consistent with what we were reading as we read through the Mismore that explained the motivation, which is 26 through 30. And that's the relatively easy part, because the real work is coming to know and accept what the Torah says about the Moed Mikre while developing an understanding of how the Nabi portrayed them in conjunction with Dote. We must then weave what we learn in the Mismore into these discoveries to develop a complete picture. And along the way, those who come to embrace the truth must be willing to go where few dare tread. Because to find the answer, those on this quest must first expose and condemn the fundamentals of Judaism and Christianity. The recognition that Dode served to fulfill the Moed Mikre. When you don't even recognize half of them, as in Judaism, which you misconstrue all of them, which you're searching for an unnamed Messiah, where you deny their fulfillment, you have to blow up Judaism to accept the truth. And of course, Christianity is fundamentally based upon misrepresenting what occurred, using a myth and a misnomer. Along the way, we also encounter some bumps in our path which must be addressed. Uh, one such obstacle uh, is here in Ms. Moore 22.8. There's an abrupt change in voice from Dode serving as a first-person narrator to him relating what he had heard said about him. Adding complexity, Dode is being addressed directly and the first sentence as you, then indirectly in the next three sentences as he or him. And then there's also the challenge of the opening verb, galal. Galal means to roll away. It sounds awkward to our ears when reading it in this context that, you know, Yah was going to roll him away. But that's fine. Since the dialogue attributed to these idiots was not inspired and is only true or appropriate in the sense that it accurately conveys what they said, what they stated. Mm -hmm. And it isn't as, all, as uh, ill-fitting in Hebrew as it sounds in English because it would have been extrapolated to mean that to be removed, to be freed. To roll away is to remove, to free. Moreover, in the native tongue, there are additional connotations which would have been intended. It is likely that he would have been crucified before the Golgotha encampment of uh, Moriah, which derives its name from the same verb, Kalal. 
Additionally, Galal is used to reveal that the collective guilt of Yisrael would be rolled away in this fashion before the children of Yisrael crossed the Jordan and finally entered into the promised land. Gaal was used while they were looking up to the very place that this was going to transpire. Where wow. Yahweh said, I'm going to roll away the guilt. So there's more to it than, you know, it first resonates within our ears. Right. Pertaining to Mizmor 22.8, knowing the response of the onlookers is helpful because it not only reveals that they used Yahweh's name, in conjunction with Dod serving as the Passover lamb, they also recognized that he had spoken of having a close and intimate relationship with Yahweh. He had obviously spoke, spoken of, of doing what he knew Yahweh wanted, and as a result of wanting to be with him, God would rescue Dod's soul. So that's what they were conveying. So as we move on to address the next statement, we're faced with yet another challenge. We have not been told, because we do not need to know, how Yahweh engineered the placement of Dode's soul in this now discarded body. Having studied Yashaya, Isaiah 7.14, we know that the prophecy simply states that a young woman would give birth to a child just as Dode became our Heavenly Father's beloved son when he was enveloped in Yah's maternal spirit, the same is likely true with the body he referred to as uh, most likely using the Yahusha name, Yahweh saves. So, now referring to his role as a uh, uh, first-person narrator, uh, we find that the principal actor and eyewitness, even from the very beginning, we discover how uh, he came to this place. He uh, said, Indeed, you had me gush forth and thrash about in normal childbirth from the womb, causing me to be ready by relying upon my mother's breasts. Psalm 22, 9. Christians don't have any problem with, you know, the uh, miraculous conception and somehow uh, God becoming uh, the baby Jesus. If all of God, the Christian God, fed into the baby Jesus, and we killed the entirety of God, I guess, on the Roman uh, stake, because uh, those Jews were really mad at him. Uh, but, to believe that Yahweh could take Dode's soul, an actual human soul that actually existed, and place that soul inside of a body, because that's what happens at conception, is difficult. Huh? How, how, does, how do you think that God is bringing Dode back to be the king of kings if Dode's soul doesn't exist so that it can be used in that way? How is God going to take Elia and to bring him back as one of the two witnesses if this isn't occurring? Do you think that Elia is going to come back with a 2,500-year-old body? <laughs> I mean, so if God can do that, why is it difficult to understand how he would put Dode's soul into this, uh, this child who was be born the normal way. And for Dode, this is a good thing because Dode made it really clear you know, that his mother and father, the first time around, were really crappy. Yeah. He had a terrible family. That's why he was down there in, in Bethlehem tending sheep uh, as a young, young child. Is that uh, his father, when we hear from him, you know, he's Yeshe, uh, Jesse, doesn't say anything that's, uh, that's even quasi-intelligent. And we hear nothing of his mother. So at least he had what appears to be, uh, you know, we don't know her name, um, 
certainly she was not named Mary because uh, it means embittered and uh, <coughs> no reason for her to be embittered. It's one thing for uh, Moshe's sister to be named uh, embittered. Mary in Hebrew does mean uh, embittered uh, because they were living in a, in a bitter situation when she was named. Yeah, they were slaves uh, and the really, really horrible situation where the male babies were being murdered and they were being worked to death in fields of mud making uh, bricks. It couldn't be worse. Uh, this is worse than, than uh, the experience during the Holocaust. Um, and so that's one thing. So there's no chance that, that uh, mom number two was named uh, embittered. Uh, so I do we don't have would either be... of his mother's names, so it's irrelevant, no, you know? Yeah. Yes. So yes, the name's not mentioned in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, so it's, God doesn't think it's uh, it's relevant. But it oh, is what? relevant to say that uh, uh, by using this graphic depiction of natural childbirth, that this was not a miraculous uh, nativity. It yes. describes the rupturing of the amniotic uh, sac and the commencement of labor, uh, known. Uh, Colloquially, is uh, is having the pregnant uh, mother's water breaking, is what he's describing here. That this is natural childbirth being pushed out of the womb during pain contraction. The mother must contract her womb to deliver the child in less than 24 hours after uh, the uh, Gayak men occurs, uh, using the Hebrew term for the newborn safety to prevent infection. Similarly, this newborn child was like all others and that he had to rely on his biological mother's breast milk to fight off infection and survive. This was as ordinary as ordinary gets. And clearly the body that was turned into the crimson grub was ordinary. Even Yashaya says the body was ordinary. You wouldn't take any special note because that was the purpose, just an ordinary body. It didn't happen the way that your Christmas pageantry has it. Now, we're going to stop uh, broadcasting here in about 30 seconds, but we'll still oh, record. We'll go, we'll go a little bit further right. and deeper into this. Uh, okay. So the fact is that we do not understand how a new soul is generated during conception. We just don't. A lot of scientists in the world who's even studying it because it lies outside the realm of our perceptions. It's just like no science can, scientist can tell you what dark matter or dark energy is. They, we use those terms. We don't even know if the terms are, uh, are reasonable. All we know is there's something that isn't matter that has an attractive nature to it, so we call it dark matter because okay. we, we can't it's see it. Dark. And uh, there's something out there that has a repulsive nature, which is the nature of energy, pushes things apart. That's why you know, energy in our universe causes the universe to expand. Uh, matter in our universe uh, causes it to contract. It is now expanding faster than the speed of light because the space between things is growing. Uh, and that is because there's more dark, unknown energy in it or a repulsive something that is repulsive uh, than there is uh, matter, even though uh, only a tiny fraction of the, uh, of the stars that we, uh, we can see and note uh, uh, make up the matter of the universe. The rest of it is not like any matter we can understand, but yet it's still there. So the fact is, we don't understand what a soul is. Close to home, billions upon billions of them, we've got a clue what they are. We don't know where they come from. We don't know where they go. We can't access the composition of one. We know that it exists. We know that all animals have one and that it has no mass and thus must be a form of energy and that its arrival is the spark of life while its departure is coterminous with death. We can talk about it, but... For God to say, this is how I put one of them from Dod in a baby is so far beyond our understanding because we don't even know what they are. 
are how they get there. Therefore, based on our inability to understand even the most fundamental aspects of a nephesh, we should not be surprised that Yahweh did not try to explain the process in Dode's uh, second coming. And speaking of Dode, as Yahweh anointed, uh, as his anointed, he was the handsome man. In his first life, we were told he was beautiful. Um, and as Yahweh's firstborn son, he will return in God's image and be as magnificent as Yahweh, as brilliant as the sun. But this time, during the second of three appearances, the baby boy and man Dode's nephesh occupied was nothing special. Uh, that's exactly what Yeshia affirms in the 53rd chapter. Uh, but since this corporeal form would be abused and discarded, the less desirable the body means sacrifice, the better. Kambakotam, it would be good riddance. Recognizing Dode's brilliance, I would not be surprised if he intended for us to consider how the metaphors he selected also apply to the Yatsa, the Exodus. Mm -hmm. Since he was reenacting the intensity of, uh, uh, of what is really a personal manifestation of the Exodus. The symbolic message inherent during the initial experience of Chagmatsa begins with the doorway to liberation and life being opened during Pesach, while the firstborn of their religious and political oppressors were dying all around them. The children of Yisrael walked out of Eretz Mitzrayim during Matzah, entering the Sinai wilderness on this day. It was indicative of walking away and disassociating from the caustic and controlling influence of religion and politics, thereby unyeasting their souls of its corrupting stench. Then during Bukhotam, they would be reborn in a flood of water, yeah. entering their new life as the sea came crashing down behind them. After receiving the Torah and following a period of attitude adjustment, for infantile <laughs> tantrums, they were headed to the promised land as children who would be nurtured by the milk the land would provide. So Dode is, is, is telling a personal story that is also uh, indicative of Dode representing all of Israel. And the fulfillment of Chagmatsa using these, these graphic language is indicative of what was foretold as the children of Israel walked out of Mitzrayim. It's the same story. Before you, I was cast out of the point of origin and this occurred as an act of compassion and love. From the womb of my mother, you are my God. So, Dode wasn't, um, your, um, born the ordinary way, wasn't the ordinary fellow. Um, the soul inside of, uh, of that uh, child, of natural childbirth, uh, was the most exemplary soul in human history. And um, he knew Yahweh right from the beginning. It's a interesting presentation in that um, Shalak, which was uh, used, I was cast out. It's not a comforting mm -hmm. term. It means to throw, to cast, to hurl, to fling, even to throw away, to cast out. But isn't that exactly what happened with Dode's soul? It was cast out. Absolutely. Sure, yeah. And thrown away, at least temporarily, during matzah. Mm -hmm. In an extremely tough situation. And that's just the beginning of the harsh implications. 
because uh, the verb was written in the very uncommon hopeful stem, which is inconsistent with free will. It indicates that the subject, Yahweh in this case, was forced or at the very least compelled to part with him for a while such that Dode briefly was cast out. Yeah, you heard that correctly. The hopeful stem means that Yahweh was compelled to part with Dode's soul, at least for that time. Therefore, the arguments in favor of it were compelling. For Yahweh to be compelled, that means that Dode's arguments, his justifications as to why they should part company for this time, for Dode to serve in this role, had to be compelling. Dode was brilliant. He made the right decision for the right reason, and God agreed with him. And because of that, there, you know, the 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 God who is uh, is devoted to free will. Uh, in this particular case, is admitting that I was compelled to do this. Uh, he could be following Dode's free will in the hopeful step. Therefore, the argument in favor of it is very, very compelling. And fortunately, in the perfect conjugation, the compulsion and the intensity of being cast off was short-lived. This was literally one and done. Mm-hmm. Okay. With the hopeful stem being applied by Dode when addressing Yahweh, it speaks volumes about the nature of their relationship, the confidence Dode had in Yahweh, and about the conclusions that we have already drawn. Dode's arguments on behalf of his soul being allowed to serve in this way were convincing. Indeed, they were undeniable. To earn Yisrael's respect to the extent required to serve as their eternal king, Dode wanted this opportunity, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. A brilliant man made a compelling argument. I don't think there's anything that Yahweh enjoys more. For one of his creation to make an argument that is so sound, so brilliant, so compassionate, so perfect that he is in a position where he can't deny it. (laughs) I think it's the happiest moment of Yahweh's life, personally. You know, you said you you uh, you were talking about he he wanted to make some things right. Also, it was an opportunity to do that because of his son, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that turned against him and those sort of things. But also, you know, he had some really big, big, um, bad moments with the, so many people he when he chose not to do it. I mean, he could make it. He could have also appealed to him at that point, you know, and then I can make that right as well. I, I am glad you brought that up. I, I think that Dode had uh, other issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not talking about them so much uh, now, but it's, it's, it's fair game to bring them up. Um, I can tell you in eternity we won't be talking about them. No, um, no, no. But Dode, the Dode had made some very bad calls in his life. Um, one of those bad calls is God gave him three options and said, you know, any one of these three is, is good for you. The, the obvious choice was to take option three, which was to um, avoid the... Uh, Run out. The, yeah. yeah, just... Go uh, hide out uh, in the caves again. Go, yeah. go hide out. You know, we'll, we could still be together. But just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, hide out for a little uh, while and let this all pass through. And that was the obvious choice, he, but he picked another one, and it caused the uh, the death of tens of thousands of his people. Horrible decision. The decision to send his uh, most loyal uh, supporter and uh, and the general defending his people off into a battle mm-hmm. that he was almost certain he would die so he could steal his uh, wife. What a horrible decision. 
Uh, I think the decision, though, that haunted him the most uh, was the one where his uh, uh, eldest son raped his eldest daughter. And then he did not respond to, first of all, bad parenting. I mean, it doesn't have to be bad parenting because, you know, our children can do bad things even with good parents. But it... It isn't a, you're not going to put that on your resume and say, this is one of the acts that I'm most responsible for. I, I raised a son who, uh, where my first son raped uh, my uh, eldest daughter. It's a blight. But Doe didn't respond to it appropriately. There are, there's a tour instructions that what you're supposed to do in these circumstances, Doe didn't do it. And so to save the honor of his sister and deal with it, Absalom, his uh, third-born son, went and killed his firstborn. Mm-hmm. because Dode didn't deal with it. And Dode, I think, took responsibility for that and said, you know, I'm, I'm bad. My bad. I should have done it. I understand his motivation for doing it. And because Dode didn't do the right thing, Absalom then, uh, you know, um, led this rebellion against his father. He lost respect for his father. And ultimately, he rebelled, and, and we know the story where uh, Absalom was uh, was killed, uh, and and Dode wept like a baby. Uh, in fact, Dode even said, "You know, Absalom, I I would uh, I would bow before you. You can be my king." Uh, Dode felt so much guilt for what caused all of that, and I can see Dode negotiating with you mm-hmm. and saying, "You know." Um, Obviously, I don't want people talking about the bad mistakes that I made. I've done some embarrassing things, and I, you know, I, I don't want people talking about those. I want to make up for for my own. Yeah, let me make it right. You know, because, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. because uh, yeah. Dode represents all Yisrael. Uh, there are wonderful moments, and there's tragic moments, and he wants to make up for the tragic moments. So he's taking his own guilt into Sheol along with, with ours. Mm-hmm. But I think I personally think, as much as Absalom meant to Dode, that uh, Dode went to uh, to Yahweh and say, you know, I, I uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this, but here's what I want from you. I want to be able to take the the guilt of Absalom with me because I'm responsible for uh, for what he did and. Uh, that's my uh, my special personal benefit. Uh, please don't deny me this. I, I think that he, I mean, I'm projecting here. There's no evidence of it, but you're trying to understand the motivation. I, I think that it's likely that that occurred. Sounds totally like to me. Yeah, uh, I think it. I think it's like the occurred. Just reading the story. Yeah, yes. came to the same conclusion. He even yeah. passed over. The Yarden yes. uh, for Absalom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I think there's there's lots of of, uh, of subplots into this that were important sure. important and, and understand that Dode and Yahweh yeah. had a thousand years to chat about it. Well, yeah. sort of. I could say they had a thousand <laughs> years to chat about it because it was a thousand years, but that's really not true, is it? Because Dode wrote this mismoor during his life as king. Yeah. So, yeah. Dode had convinced Yahweh to allow him to do it while he was still well, in the midst of his uh, first life. Yeah. It has to be. Had That's to be. why he stole it. Otherwise, yeah. he couldn't have written it. He couldn't have seen it. No, no. Right. He couldn't have written it. So, that's pretty cool. So, he he figured it out while he was still on Earth, which makes it makes him even more brilliant and I think this is the thing that really <laughs> what, excites me. What was he Yawa. not brilliant about? You know, and, um, I've, uh, I've devoted the last 22 years of my life trying to understand Yahweh's overall message and the implications in it and to be able to, to convey it in a way that is pertinent and exciting to uh, modern ears uh, and what it means mm-hmm. in, in our place and time. And I can't imagine being in a position where I would um, come up with an argument with God 
that would be so pervasive. God says, you know, you're right. Let's go. Let's go do it that way. I mean, I can't. I can't I mean, that is so far. And just 22 years of doing this, you know, uh, 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, and uh, I can't even I can't even fathom it. I mean, that's that's how far Dode was intellectually. Uh, beyond us and then the quality of his relationship with you. I, I've got a wonderful relationship with that. We're, 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 are, uh, are very close. It's, uh, and, and it's fun and, and liberating and empowering and all wonderful things. But, yes. Wow. Well, wow. Yeah, that yeah. one, yeah, that one's really, uh, that's really special. So now you can see one of the reasons that, uh, yeah, I was so over the top saying, He's my chosen one. He's my firstborn. He's yeah. the most set apart. He is the branch. He is the shepherd. He is the lamb. He is uh, the king. He is the messiah. Uh, it, it goes on and on because God's really proud. And it, it indicates that with all the frustration that he's had with Israel and all the dunderheads and all the religious buffoons, that the experiment of creating man and woman wasn't wasted because look what this guy figured out. Yeah. And because of what he figured out, we get to enjoy it's life really in right. the same benefits because Dode recognized one of the things that uh, struck me very early in this process, which is that by encouraging more people to become part of the covenant and live with us throughout eternity and therefore to divide the our inheritance among more people as opposed to fewer people, the more people we are of like mind that we divide our inheritance, which is the universe between, the more the richer the experience. Yes. Yeah. It's the opposite of what you would normally expect. And I think Dode also figured that out, that his relationship with Yahweh was wonderful, but it would be even more wonderful if there were more wonderful people that he could share it with. And we take the exact same approach. You found the thing that's the most valuable thing in the universe, being part of Yahweh's covenant family. And, and it's while you while you care deeply about it, the thing you most want to do is to give it away, to share it. And I think that's what Dode's motivation finally was. I, I've, uh, I've been <laughs> given it. It's going to be a richer, more wonderful experience if uh, we can work together as father and son and have more people receive it. Yeah, when you're spending eternity with the same people, you might want to shake it up a little bit. You know, you might get bored of hanging out with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I, yeah, I, I think that Thanks. that's the <laughs> deal, you know, that uh, clearly God wanted a family. And, uh, yeah. and, and those more than is, uh, yes, yeah. more the, yeah. well, to some extent, you know, the, the more right. yeah. of like-minded yeah. people, uh, oh, yes. the more wonderful it's going Depth to be. And, right. and in this particular case, no one is going to be dr begrudged out of his very special right. place. You know, uh, no. David, uh, who is our uh, webmaster, he was uh, talking to uh, to us the, sometime this week, and he said, you know, I've always known that Yahweh plays favorites, and he should. You know, Yahweh goes up to people and introduces yeah. himself that he wants to be with. Uh, and so it's his universe, it's his home, uh, it's his family. He is entitled to to spend his time with the people he chooses to be around. And he has, he said very clearly, my criterion for who I enjoy is very different than than mankind's. So he has his qualities that he's uh, he's looking for, and Dode was the person who embodied more of those qualities than anyone else, and we can see now why. But as uh, David said, it's one thing to understand that God can play favorites, but to give Dote all of these accolades 
there just had to be something beyond the fact that God loved him. And now we know. Yeah. There was. Mm-hmm. He's this earned. This is so earned. satisfying. This, it is. This storyline is just so remarkable. I can relate to a human being. Uh, all those things that we talked about years ago about uh, that were disturbing about even if Yahweh's soul was in there because he can't raise his own, he can't adopt himself. You know, it just it had to be it had to be doed. I mean, it's, yes. uh, it's it just had close. to be. And, yeah. it, it, uh, and even the elegant solution that we've come up with for a working solution for all these years, which was that Yahweh has mm-hmm. a nephesh and he projected his nephesh uh, into a, uh, a body uh, that yeah. uh, that he. Uh, uh, likely called De Yosha, Yahweh uh, saves. Um, and that he used his soul as an avatar, as a probe, so that he could experience these things without actually being there. Uh, yeah. that, that elegant solution. That was satisfying so, up it, to a point. But, it, yeah. but it's, it is necessary as a component of what actually occurred. Because now it's Dodes and Fesh that is being used as yeah. the avatar and the probe. Yeah. So we weren't it is wrong, still, just it, wrong person. Yeah, it we weren't wrong. Wrong soul. Wrong right. soul. Yeah. right. Yes. But but actually, I'm not even sure it's the wrong soul because they're father and son. Yeah. So it. Uh, um, I can tell you that. In terms of uh, of Yahweh experiencing the pain and anguish of separation and of uh, the pain of, uh, of, of of physical pain of of uh, Pesach, the intensity that he would feel that pain and what he gave to enable it this way was infinitely greater than if it had been himself. Mm-hmm. I can see and that. every loving parent would say the same thing. If I had the choice, I would much I prefer to endure this myself than have my child endure it. Yeah. And if you have this kind of relationship with that child, uh, that's a, uh, as a, I can tell you that when Yahweh says, I'm going to provide the lamb, uh, this was a, uh, um, a way of doing it that was brilliant for everyone involved and consistent with the story from beginning to end. Yeah. And yeah. for those that want to, you know, they say, well, that uh, the uh, you know a person uh, can't save another, and all of this, the the Yahweh uses the lamb symbolically uh, to open that doorway of life, but the 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 bigger issue is what happened on matzah. And by sending Dode's soul to to Sheol, and Yashaya says that that it was burdened with uh, our guilt. He carried it. So yeah, literally what he did is Dode took our guilt with him into Sheol and left it there. Brilliant. In a black hole. That's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, don't come so, out. You know, if, if we won't be judged because there's nothing, there's no evidence to hold against us. It's all in that black hole. Yeah, <laughs> it's just perfect. That's how it yeah, works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, you, wow. Wait a minute. How could I judge him or her? Uh, there's no evidence against <laughs> Yo, them. Where's you? Where's well, the you evidence go? A, a black hole over there. <laughs> Well, I want that evidence. I ain't going in there to find it. Uh, I'll go there to find it. Okay, well, good luck with that. The cosmic dump. Let me know how that works out for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll wait. Yeah. We're, yeah. Well, I'm not going to wait real long, but okay. Yeah. We'll hold the door for you. Ready? <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a uh, fun program. I'm sorry that if I got a little worked up here and there, but... Uh, uh, no, no. This no. is this is really Most passionate. This is one yeah, of those I'm things good. where uh, the head and the heart are both engaged. This yeah. this is not just a cerebral thing. It is a, it's an emotional thing and a uh, a cerebral uh, realization. Uh, it 
it just goes right to the gut. Uh, if you're yeah. Jewish, it should be a, a gut punch. I mean, you, you know, I, I said, uh, and it's true. This is embarrassing. But it's also enormously gratifying. All right. Well, thank you. We look forward to being with you this time next week. May Yah bless. Have a wonderful Shabbat. And as I say, we look forward to picking up this and we'll, we'll continue to make our way through the um, 22nd Mismore. And I think maybe after that, we'll go into a review of, uh, of Daniel 9. I think you'll get a, 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 a yeah, that's certain be fun, that Daniel yeah. 9 and, and Yashaya 9 from this perspective will also be very satisfying, as uh, yeah. is, uh, is 2 Samuel uh, 7. It's now that you understand <laughs> who was doing what to whom, all the pieces fall into place, and it makes uh, perfect sense in the story is consistent from beginning to end. Yeah. So, our pleasure to bring it with you. I hope you're enjoying uh, listening to it, and I, I do hope that all who listen will uh, choose to let this resonate within them, both their minds and uh, and in their hearts. May y'all bless. Look forward to being with you next week. Happy Shabbat. Night, y'all. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, yes. Bye-bye. Bye, Kurt.